Hi everyone, um, I am going to make a video here that gives you an overview of all of the um, homework assignments. Um, I'm going to be doing these live, so I'm sure I could be coming up with some errors along the way here, but I'll try not to. Let me change my virtual background to something easier, like nothing that makes it easier. Yeah, look as good. Ooh, okay. That's enough of that. Okay. So let's just start with um, topic one. Okay, two, so this was the introduction review kind of nature. Two striking features of a graph of US real GDP over the 20th century are. Um, so this would be, um, you know, if you're looking at the real GDP as it's changed over time, um, we know it's not this because it did not decrease. Um, well, it, I'm sorry, it did decrease during the 1930s, but it was not constant um, over the course of the 20th century. Um, it was not downward in the first half of the century. And it was not constant in the first half of the century. The answer was in fact a, it's basically been increasing 1930s, right, 2008, COVID, right, it's been increasing over time. Okay. Um, how fast is, um, a measure of how fast the growth rate of prices is, that is our definition of the inflation rate. That would be B, number two. And number three. Deflation, deflation, that's the definition of falling prices. That would be our answer, see. If it's not, um, this would be inflation. That would be when prices increase, this is prices decreasing. Okay, number four. Um, all the following are types of macroeconomic data except, um, well, the big three are these. So the correct answer in this case is A. A is not a macroeconomic piece of data. GDP, inflation, and unemployment rate, B, C, and D, those are the big three that we focus on um, in this class. Okay, what are the variables that a model takes as given? What is that definition? Um, that would be exogenous. Basically, it's coming from outside of the model. When it's endogenous, that means it's generated within the model. Exogenous is just taken as a given. It's something that's happening that the model needs to accommodate rather than define. C and D have no point here. You really should have been choosing between A and B. The correct answer, B and B. Number six, in the simple model of supply and demand for pizza, when buyer's income increases, when the, price, uh, when the buyer's income increases, the price of pizza. Now, in some sense, we're gonna have to presume that pizza is a normal good. So if the income is increasing, that would lead to my demand curve shifting out. Then the price should be increasing and the quantity would be increasing as well. Meaning that our answer is B. So you had to assume that this was a, um, um, we, we had to assume that this was a normal good. Okay. Um, number seven. 
Which of the following is the best example of a sticky price? So the definition of a sticky price is basically something that for whatever reason is reluctant to change. Um, it just doesn't change very often. And probably the, well, the price of a barrel of oil, that is certainly not a sticky price. It changes every second um, and there is an active market for it. Same with foreign exchange. Same with stock market as long as it's open. But soda in a vending machine, right? You'd have to like reprogram it to accept different kinds of coins and you just change a little label in it. This would be a sticky price. So basically a sticky price is something that is reluctant to change. Okay. Number eight, what does macroeconomic not try to answer? Um, so if we're talking about an entire country and its growth rate, that would be a macro question. So we know it's not A. Um, what causes recessions and depression? That is a macro question. High rates of inflation, that's a macro question because it's dealing with inflation. Rate of return on education, that is a microeconomic question because here we're looking at a particular good or service and whether we should engage in that um, decision on our own. So that would be a microeconomic question. Number nine. Well, this is kind of another way of asking number five. But instead of saying that it's um, something that's um, outside, uh, it's sorry, that's taken as given, another way of saying it would be is that it's determined outside the model. So my description of exogenous is not changing here. It's just a different way of saying the same thing. And all these are not relevant. And then finally, number 10, um, during the period of 19, between 1900 and 2000, um, when was the unemployment rate the highest? That would be during the Great Depression. Okay, I'm gonna pause things here before I go all off to the second one. Okay, let's do homework number two. Okay. So now we have 7 million workers who are unemployed. 143 who are employed and total population, adult population is 200 million. And so we're asked here, what is the um, unemployment rate? So the definition of the unemployment rate would be the number of unemployed over the civilian labor force. Which in this case, is going to be 7 million over civilian labor force, which is the unemployed and the, I'm sorry, the employed and the unemployed. Running that, that gets us about um, 4.7. Number two. If the number of unemployed increases while well, the number of unemployed does not change, what will happen to the unemployment rate? So using that same equation of number of unemployed over the civilian labor force. So what we're saying here is that this number would not change and that we would have something that is increasing plus something that is not changing. Well, basically if the denominator is becoming larger and there's no change in the numerator, 
then the rate itself will be decreasing. Number three, what is the economic statistic used most often to measure the prices? This is definitional. It would be letter B. The reason why D is not correct, just in case you were curious, we, um, this would be the GDP deflator. Um, and that's not what we're referring to here. Okay, number four. Um, chain weighted measures of real GDP. What do those uh, make use of prices? So if it's chain weighted, the whole idea of the chain weighting is that the base here is um, continuously changing. That's just part of the definition of what it means to be chain weighted. Number five, uh, what is the underground economy? What would it consist of? Well, it's not gonna be what's in the GDP accounts because that's the legal part of the economy. Does it include only illegal activities? Not necessarily. Um, you could have legal activities that are just occurring underground, meaning they're outside of, um, um, it's not illegal for me to necessarily, you know, sell lemonade at the end of my driveway. Um, just for 43 year old man, it's just kind of creepy. Um, illegal drug trade, that would be underground economy. Um, that leaves us with C, which is the correct answer. If there's no social security tax being collected, then those workers um, are, you know, it's a legal activity um, to have a domestic worker. It becomes illegal when you're not collecting social security taxes, meaning it's under the table, thus making it um, an underground economy. If you answered, um, B, and this was the exam, I might have accepted it because there might be a way to justify it, but um, C is the best answer. Number six, if the nominal GDP grew by 5% and the real GDP grew by 3%, then the GDP deflator, what uh, must it have been? Well, it's the difference between the two. It's the 2% because that's the, um, rate at which the prices are increasing. So the real GDP um, that's measuring our change in quantity, this is measuring our change in quantity and our change in price. So the difference between the two, if this is five and this is three, is two. Should be our price change. Number seven, um, in the national income accounts, um, what are um, all the following would be a government purchase except? Um, well, paying for police officers hours and services, that would be um, a purchase. Purchasing hardware, that is a purchase. Services provided by U.S. Senators, that, that would be we pay them to do their job. But if I just give people money, like A, that's not a purchase, that's a transfer. So the correct answer for number seven is A. Number eight, if the adult population equals 250 million, 145 million are employed, 5 million are unemployed, then what is my um, labor force uh, participation? My labor force participation here is going to be 60, 60%. Um, 60 um, our equation, um, our equation for the um, labor force participation rate um, it's my labor force divided by the population and my labor force here equals the 150 million over 250 million. And the math checks out 60%. Number nine. Now again, I'm doing this 
in real time. So if I make an error here as I go along, I actually have no idea if I'm answering the right things. Uh, I suspect I am, but um, uh, there's always a chance that I'm not. Uh, an increase in the price of imported goods, where are we going to um, see that occurring? So imported goods, the key thing there is that if you see, uh, it can't be in the GDP deflator. So, uh, because imported goods are subtracted. So we can cross out already B um, and we can cross out C. So then the question is, right, the only thing that separates out A from D is whether it's in the CPI. And it is because we can buy imported goods and those imported goods would be part of our basket of goods um, that we buy. So the correct answer is A. Number 10. Circular flow model, flow of dollars from firms to household. Um, how, what does that um, represent? Um, well, firms give us money in wages. They could also give us money in terms of giving us like a dividend um, on investments we made. Or um, if we have some part ownerships, it could also be measured as profits. So those are all parts of it. And why, what are we um, buying from firms? We are buying goods and services. Number 11. In the national income accounts, consumption expenditures include all the following, except household purchases of new residential housing. That's part of investment. Number 12. Um, what is the GDP deflator? What kind of index it is? This is definitional. It's a posh price index. B. Number 13, real GDP, what is it measuring? Um, it's doing the mean value of goods and services. Um, it's doing that based on constant prices or a base year price. Can't be this. And you wouldn't want it changing all the time. So instead of saying constant, we could have said base and that would have been the same thing. Number 14, when prices of different goods are increasing by different amounts, the price index that will rise the fastest is. Um, so in this case, um, the GDP deflator is a posh index. So we can already cross out C and D because it can't possibly be both. So then the question is, is are we gonna see it in the personal consumption expenditures or the CPI? The reason why the answer is B is because it's presuming that we're gonna keep buying the same amount of stuff even though the things are increasing, which we would not expect to happen. In the personal consumption expenditures, as prices rise, people would actually buy less. So the PCI, PCE would rise just not as much because people would stop buying some of the more expensive things. CPI just presumes that uh, things keep increasing. Number 15, um, assume that the market basket of goods purchased in 2004 cost $14,000 in 2004 prices, same basket $21,000 in 2009 prices. However, basket of goods actually purchased by average family in 2009 cost $20,000 in 2009 prices, whereas the same basket would have cost $15,000 in 2004 prices. Um, a um, Las Perez um, price index of 2009 prices using 2004 as the base year would be. So now to set this up, basically, um,
I'm going to set up my basket of goods according to those two years. Giving me 1.5. Number 16. GDP is the market value of um, what in this case? This would be final goods and services. By definition, it can't be A, B, or C. Number 17. Um, the amount of capital in the economy, what is that? That would be a stock, right? Because a stock is a, the, the pool of things that exist. An investment, though, would be a flow because it changes over time, which is the definition of a flow. So our correct answer here should be B. Number 18. What is the CPI? That's the Las Perez price index. That's just definitional. 19, and on an exam or something like that, you could definitely look that up and it would tell you what you need to know. It is a price index, not a quantity index, as C indicates. Number 19, all the following are stock variables except the deficit. That's something that would be changing every year over time. Again, a flow changes over time. And then finally, number 20. If the unemployment rate is 6%, sorry, if the unemployment rate is 6% and the number of employed is 188 million, I would set it up like this because the unknown is um, the number of unemployed. I need to know what that number is to be able to solve the rest of this. So I'm going to cross multiply. Okay, so then to get the answer here, I need to take my 188 million plus my 12 million to get 200 million. So what I did here is I cross multiplied. So I did X, imagine that this is over one. X times one is X. 0 0.06 times 188 million is 11,280,000 plus 0 0.06x, because it's the x times the 0.6. Then I subtracted 0 0.06x from both sides. Then I divided each side by 0.94, thus leaving me with 12 million, which you then have to add to the 188 million to get your final answer. Okay. I'll pause this here as I set up the next one.
Okay, let's look at the next one. I'm just closing all this so that my life is easier. Okay. Okay. Number three. Again, email me if I'm making any errors as I'm doing this. So topic three is dealing with uh, money and the money supply. Okay. When would the money supply decrease? Um, well, it's not going to do that if the monetary base is increasing. Discount rate decreasing has absolutely um, no effect on things. And our, sorry, and our correct answer here is our currency deposit ratio. If people start depositing more money um, into the system, then that fractional reserve banking system will be able to lend out more money. So the correct answer for number one is B. Number two, in a fractional reserve banking system, why do banks um, create money? Or how do they create money? Well, banks do not issue currency. They're not um, transferring anything. Um, debt obligations are not really doing anything here. Um, it really is the fact that each dollar reserves is then a portion of that is lent out to others. Meaning the answer is A. What happens when there's an open market sale that has nothing to do with the multiplier, has nothing to do with the deposit ratio. So really we're looking at the monetary base. If it's selling a bond, it's going to take that money in and it's going to destroy it once it's received. Meaning their correct answer is D. Sales are contractionary monetary policy. They are decreasing the monetary base. Number four, um, if when the Federal Reserve is conducting an open market purchase, who is it buying um, bonds from? It's buying it from the public because that's exactly how it wants to decrease the money supply is by giving the public less money. Correct answer is A. Number five. For borrowing from the discount window, the Fed, what is it setting? It's setting, um, in this case, it's setting the, um, the price um, of borrowing compared to borrowing using the, um, the TAF, the, the term auction facility, where in the term auction facility, um, the Federal Reserve is setting the quantity. Because at the discount window, there is a discount rate. Number six. Uh, if we increase the money supply, what is the, how would the Federal Reserve um, accomplish this? You know what, <laughs> technically, um, The correct answer is A, up until the pandemic, COVID-19. Under COVID-19, you could actually also say C, and that would also be correct. So the absolute correct answer is actually A and C, but that's a different matter. 
Number seven. In a 100% um, reserve banking system, uh, banks would not be able to affect the money supply anymore because they would just be collecting all the deposits and storing them. So the correct answer here is D. Number eight, open market operations. What are they changing? They're changing the monetary base. Okay, so already I can cross out B and D. Changes in the interest rate paid on reserves. What is that changing? That's changing um, the money multiplier. So already, I know my correct answer here. C, just to confirm for ourselves though, changes in the discount rate, what is that gonna change? That would be changing the monetary base. Number nine. Um, in a 100% reserve banking system, if the, the customer deposits $100 of currency, then the money supply, as I just said, remains the same. Nothing would change here because no money is going to be lent out. If a country is on the gold standard, then this one should be hopefully pretty easy here. It'd be the amount of gold because we are on a gold standard. Oh, this one should even be easier. That's the definition of the central bank. I hope that none of you got that one wrong. Number 12. An important factor in the evolution of commodity money to fiat money, like what caused that trans um, that transition? So commodity money, remember that's things like shells, rocks, trees, I don't know, I'm just making up stuff, to a fiat money, so like the dollar. Well, it's because those things are really heavy to carry around, meaning that the transaction costs are going to be reduced because I don't have to drag around this really, really heavy stuff. Number 13, compared to typical open market operations when engaging in quantitative easing operations by the Federal Reserve between 2007 and 2011, Federal Reserve purchases tended to be um, riskier and long-term. Because the idea with that, with quantitative easing, was to bring the um, short-term interest rate and long-term interest rate closer together. And the only way you can do that is by doing some riskier assets in the form of mortgages. Okay, to reduce the money supply, what would need to be done? That would be selling bonds because you're gonna sell the bonds that you, the Federal Reserve is gonna sell the bonds that it owns, collect the money from the public and then destroy it. And they can't just destroy deposits. They can't just say, I'm gonna take money out of your bank account. Sorry, I just realized I hadn't added those things here. Okay. Number 15, the last one from homework number three. The amount of capital banks are required to hold, um, what does it depend on? Uh, it depends on how risky the bank's assets are. Um, and this is largely because of the 2008-2009 crisis that that occurs. Okay. Okay, let's do number four. Don't think that like, I'm not trying to be like, and, and I mean, obviously I made, um, I made a fair number of these. Um, other of these I stole from others. Um, so shouldn't be, they shouldn't be too difficult for me. And obviously I'm not trying to show off here by doing them super fast. I'm saying I could get be getting some of these wrong. So hopefully I'm not, but okay. So this is um, homework number four. This is talking um, uh, largely about um, inflation. 
Yeah, changes in prices. Okay, so when a purchase, person purchases a 90-day treasury bill, what would she, he or she not know? Well, they wouldn't know what the, the inflation rate's gonna be, so they're not gonna know the ex post. Um, they're gonna know the nominal because that's, what the, um, because that's what's told to them. They probably are going to have some expectations, which would mean cross out B and D. The only thing they don't know is what did that, they don't know the future. Unless they're Marty McFly or Biff from Back to the Future, they're just not going to know. So the correct answer is A. Number two, if consumption depends positively on the level of real, uh, real balances and real balances depend negatively on the, on the nominal interest rate, then what are we going to see here? Well, um, the money growth uh, money growth is going to rise. But as the money growth is rising, um, basically what we're going to see here is that consumption is going to start to fall. So if consumption is going to start to fall, that already means that I can cross out C and D. Um, and our classical dichotomy, in fact, does not hold anymore um, because they are not moving um, in the inverse direction anymore. And your answer is B. Number three. If the real interest rate is declining by 1%, inflation rate is increasing by 2%, then what is the um, nominal rate? How is that changing? So remember here, nominal equals real plus inflation. So we're saying this is going up by 2%, real interest rate goes down by one, then this presumably would be going up by one, meaning that my correct answer here should be B. Or four. What is the right of seniorage? That is the, by definition, that is your right to print money. That's just definitional. Number five, um, in the case of unanticipated increases in inflation, um, who is um, affected by this? Um, as I'm reading this here, that would be A, um, the creditors would be hurt because if it's unindexed, meaning it doesn't change as inflation changes, the unexpected increase in inflation means you're going to get paid back with less valuable money. Thus, they are going to be hurt by this proposal. Number six. According to the classical dichotomy, um, when the money supply is decreasing, then um, the price level would be decreasing. That is, by definition, the classical dichotomy. Number seven, uh, during hyperinflation, real tax revenue often drops substantially. And I guess the question then is why would that happen? Well, that would be because of that delay, that delay that happens between the two. Number eight, in the long run, According to the quantity theory of money and classical macro theory, if the velocity is constant, then what determines real GDP and what determines nominal GDP? So this together would be nominal GDP. So the money supply is going to be determining the, uh, the um, uh, yeah. So the uh, money supply is going to be determining the nominal GDP. So I can already cross out B and D. So now what's going to determine the real GDP? The first part of this. Um, 
the real GDP is this Q. And if we want to know what's going to determine that Q, well, that would be the um, velocity. Because if it was the productive capabilities of the economy, that Q would be constant. So our correct answer, sorry, no, um, sorry. Um, does not say, it says the long run, sorry. Sorry, sorry, I didn't see that. Uh, because it says the long run, I almost been there though. Because it says the long run um, and the velocity is constant, which I just saw right there, can't be C. Then this would be determined by the PPF, which is saying that in the too good economy, I'm just gonna presume I'm on my PPF. And what's the correct answer is A. Number nine. If the Fed announces that it will raise the money supply in the future, but does not, but does not change the money supply today, then um, what will happen? Um, well, we're going to see some inflation here. So we already know it can't be A or B. So now the question is, um, is the nominal interest rate going to decrease or increase? It's going to increase because the price level is increasing, right? Um, uh, right, we saw that right here. If inflation is increasing, then the um, nominal interest rate would also be increasing. So my correct answer is D. Number 10. What do you do to end hyperinflation? Well, you basically need to slow the economy down. You would do that by raising taxes and cutting spending. Um, a, C, and D would just make the inflation worse. Number 11. Ex ante real interest rate, what is that going to be based on? Um, well, that's based on the expected inflation. And the ex post, that would be your actual. So the only way that that works is a, that's definition of what ex ante and ex post means. So that's how we knew that to be the case. Number 12. What is the inflation tax? That would be the fact that your money is losing value. So the real value of your money is decreasing. So that's also definitional. Number 13. Um, when people want to hold, um, so now we gotta find the way that this works here. When they wanna hold blank money, the income velocity of money increases and a money demand parameter K does what? Um, so the only way we can get this to work, uh, this is inverse of each other. This can't be. There we go. So if, um, if we do hold more money, then the income velocity of money is increasing, right? We're going to be spending more money. Um, and the money demand parameter K, uh, the thing that measures our level of spending. Um, if people are holding money, then um, their demand for real money balances will fall because it is being um, held at the bank rather than in their wallet. So that money demand parameter K would be decreasing. And my correct answer is C. In number 14, what's happening according to the quantity theory of money? Who has control over the inflation rate? That would be by definition the Federal Reserve. Certainly none of these. Finally, for this assignment, number four, um, number 15, at its most general formulation, the demand function for real money balances on the level, it depends on the um, level of income and the 
interest rate, the nominal interest rate, because that's going to determine how much they hold in investments. Oh, it's unfortunate. You're not going to have seen what I was writing for that one. Sorry. Um, I will make sure I add that. Sorry about that. For number four, I don't think I was sharing my screen to show you this. So I just did a long discussion of this, but I will upload this so that you could kind of presumably follow this one um, as it's being done um, so that you could see it. Okay. Sorry about that. Number five. And in this one, we're dealing with international economics or open economies. Number one. In a small open economy, starting from a position of balanced trade, if the government is increasing the income tax, then what's that going to do in terms of the trade balance and the international flows? If the government is increasing the income tax, then they're going to decrease their um, purchases. Um, it's going to affect the inflation rate um, within the or the interest rate within the country. So all that combined is going to cause our um, the imports are going to be um, uh, reduced. The exports are going to increase as more countries buy those goods. So we are going to have a surplus. So we already know it can't be A or C. So then the question is, if there's a surplus, then we know um, in terms of the net capital flows that it has to be positive to counteract that. So B. Number two. If a graph is drawn with net exports on the horizontal axis and the real exchange rate on the vertical axis then the real exchange rate is determined by the intersection of the um, savings minus investment versus the net exports schedule. Well the net export schedule is downward sloping that would be net exports as a function of the real exchange rate. And the blank line that represents savings minus investment, savings minus investments, looks like that. That is vertical. Meaning that for number two, our correct answer is A. Number three. If domestic saving exceeds domestic investment, then what happens to net exports? And net exports would have to be positive um, if the saving exceeds this. That'd be like a country like China, for instance. And then the net capital outflows would be positive because it's, um, it's leaving the country. The correct answer would be A. Number four. In a small open economy, if domestic savings exceeds domestic investment, then what would the extra savings be used for? Making those loans to foreigners, the foreigners who are buying your, um, your goods that you are importing to that country. Number five. If the government of a small open economy wishes to reduce the trade deficit, um, what policy action would be successful in doing that? You got to slow the economy down. The only way you're going to do that is by increasing taxes. All these other things are actually going to help your economy grow faster, at least domestically. So the correct answer for number five is A. Number six. Large open economy, investment tax credit is going to raise the real interest rate. 
So what would effect what effect would that do? That would decrease the trade balance. So if I'm already seeing increase, I gotta get rid of those. So if it's decreasing the trade balance, then we know as a result it's also gonna decrease the net capital outflow because the two move in the same direction. Number seven. The value of net exports is what? The value of our net exports would be our difference between our savings and investment because the two must equal each other. Number eight. In a large open economy, the exchange rate is adjusting. It's adjusting so that net exports equals the net capital outflow, the thing we've been talking about here. Sure. Number nine, the real exchange rate. Um, what is that measuring? Well, it's not that specific. It's not specifically limited to, to Japanese yen. It's also not a specific good, so it's not gonna be cars. Question is, is it going to be the nominal exchange rate multiplied by the domestic price level or by the um, foreign price level divided by then the opposite part of that? Well, definitionally speaking, it is C. It would be by the foreign price level divided by the domestic price level. That's how we get the nominal exchange rate. And finally, number 10, small open economy. World's real interest rate is above the rate at which the national savings equals domestic investment. Then what will happen to trade? Well, there'd be a trade surplus because all the money from around the world is gonna flow into that country where you're paying that higher interest rate. So there's going to be a surplus, so already I can cross out B and D. And we know that if there's a trade surplus, we know that there has to be a positive capital outflow just because of definition of those two. Okay. Okay, so that finishes um, one through five. Again, my apologies about not having the screen for one through four. You'll be looking at my face as I'm talking about them. Um, but I will include the PDF for all of these.